Great. So I know folks are still joining us, but I think we will get started as we have a packed agenda today. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Sarah Kester, and I am the interim director of global community engagement at the Sabin Vaccine Institute, currently leading the Boost community. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, uh, Vaccine Exemplars Perspectives on Prioritizing Routine Immunization During COVID-19, which we are hosting in collaboration with the Exemplars in Global Health Program at Gates Ventures. As the world continues to tackle COVID-19, Today's session is an opportunity to shine a spotlight on successful strategies of maintaining and resuming routine immunization while grappling with the challenges associated with COVID-19. We are joined today by immunization experts from Nepal and Senegal who will be sharing their country's challenges and success stories of maintaining routine immunization services during the pandemic. Um, before we get started, I'd like to remind you of a few housekeeping points. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so just a few, few reminders, please mute yourself to limit background noise and feedback. Um, we will have a discussion later on. So if you'd like to speak during that part, please raise your hand to indicate that. Um, throughout the presentations, if you'd like to submit questions for our panelists, you can do so by utilizing the Q&A functionality. But of course, we encourage you to utilize the chat as well. Um, and finally, we really want to hear from you. We encourage you to share your perspectives throughout today's session, and we ask that you start by introducing yourself in the chat. Um, so that we begin to understand the perspectives of, of our audience, we'd like to start out with a quick poll. Um, so MJ, if we could go to the next slide, and you should see a poll box pop up momentarily. Um, so please let us know how um, has COVID-19 impacted the delivery of routine immunization services in your context? Um, so I will launch the poll. You should see that pop up um, and we'll give everyone a little bit of time to respond. Great, so I'll just give another five seconds. It looks like we still have some responses coming in. Great, so as you can see from the results, it looks like pretty much um, universally, everyone has indicated that COVID-19 has impacted the delivery of routine immunization services in their context. Um, so thank you for sharing that. There'll be some time later in the session for more discussion about your own experiences, um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, great. MJ, next slide, please. I'd now like to go ahead and introduce our panelists for today's session. So joining us today are Nate Gerthy from Gates Ventures, Dr. Musa Sar and Dara Goy from the Institute for Health Research, Epidemiological Surveillance and Training in Senegal, and Dr. Samir Dixit from the Center for Molecular Dynamics in Nepal. So with that, I will turn it over to Nate for a brief overview of the Exemplars in Global Health Program. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. Hi everybody, my name is Nate Gerthy. I'm a manager of the Child Health Work Streams uh, at uh, Gates Ventures, and good to meet you all today. So I'll give a brief overview of exemplars and then I'll hand it over to the other panelists. If you can go to the next slide, please. Awesome. So I wanna make sure we leave plenty of time for the other panelists and for discussion, but I wanted to quickly provide an overview of the exemplars in global health program which Samir, Musa, and Dauda are leading the research projects in. So Exemplars in Global Health is an initiative to study countries with exceptional performance on health outcomes or service delivery, to understand what those countries did, how they did it, 
and how lessons from them can be adapted to other contexts. Next slide, please. The exemplars program studies many topics, which you can see on this page. Uh, today's presentation relates to the fourth one, vaccine delivery, um, which seeks to study countries with above average performance in year over year increase in immunization coverage since 2000. Uh, Samir, Musa, and Dauda are the in-country experts who are leading the work in two of these exemplar countries, Nepal and Senegal, and we'll hear more from them shortly. Next slide, please. All right, so as mentioned on the previous slide, the goal of this project is to study how exemplar countries in vaccine delivery have improved vaccine coverage rates since 2000. Specifically, it looks at the factors that have unlocked historical progress and also the, the unique and new insights that can be identified to build on existing research on strong immunization programs. All of this sits under the goal of developing actionable recommendations for global stakeholders. Next slide, please. So when the pandemic hit earlier this year, our vaccine delivery research partners uh, have kindly expanded their scope and, and also studied how their countries have responded to COVID. Uh, I won't read through the entirety of this slide, but the below shows some of the broad categories that they looked into related to both disruptions from COVID and also how their countries have responded to COVID. So for example, on disruptions to COVID, they've studied areas including, uh, but not limited to, uh, disruptions to vaccine stocks, clinic attendance, staffing norms, outreach, and planned campaigns, among other things. And then on the response side, they've looked at how immunization programs were maintained and prioritized through monitoring and evaluation efforts, developing guidelines and adapting guidelines, communication strategies, outreach campaigns, and other adaptations to schedules, health workers, and vaccination locations. Next slide, please. So one last slide before I hand it over to Dr. Samir Dixit. Um, I wanna briefly return to the goal of exemplars to frame uh, that all the presenters and other colleagues and experts who are working on the exemplars program are seeking to research findings, uh, but not to stop at the research. Uh, our goal is to share these findings in a way that is helpful to others. So as you can see from the right-hand side, there's a number of approaches for this whether it be through our web platform, through partnerships to connect experts together, or through longer term services. And in all of these, our goal is to help serve professionals who are looking for, for answers on a program or a policy, uh, either by providing relevant lessons from our research uh, and or by connecting them with other experts who are well suited to answer those questions. So all of this is to say that if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them either in the chat or later in the presentation or afterwards. We wanna hear the questions that you have and we want this to be an interactive session. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand it over to Dr. Samir Dixit. Hi, hi everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. It's a um, good evening for us. Nepal, uh, in Kathmandu, where I'm currently based. And uh, it's very wonderful uh, being in front of all these uh, experts like yourselves, enthusiasts, and in immunization, I say people who love immunization and what it has to offer to the uh, humankind. So yeah, just to begin, uh, I know it's a very short presentation, but uh, Nepal was uh, considered as an exemplar country for vaccination practices, immunization, uh, for his work in the last decades or so. And uh, based on that, we worked with uh, Emory University uh, in the US, uh, and then uh, we have finished a lot of the work and the report is due. But then as we were finishing up the work, along came the COVID pandemic. And as the pandemic kind of sucked the air out of us, out of the country, out of the globe, Nepal, obviously everyone was under the impression that Nepal as a developing country with a limited resources, limited expertise would buckle under the load. And then you know, its health services will be, would be affected uh, in a very negative way. 
Well, it did. I mean, a lot of the health services were affected. But as I'm going to show to you, the immunization services, surprisingly, did not buckle so much under the pressure, although initially it went down, it picked itself up very soon and uh, quite quickly. And then over the next three, four months, uh, since um, our major part of the um, pandemic effect uh, from, let's say, March, uh, it picked up to a level where it left off uh, last year. So quite an impressive work by the Nepal government and its stakeholders, and I, I'll try to kind of explain that. So um, you may have the next slide, please. So here's the timeline, and this is important to show, and I thought I would begin with this uh, slide. In fact, there are two slides here. So what this shows is what happened from March 2020. As you know, the Wuhan COVID um, pandemic actually beca began in Wuhan in China around November, December. By January, it had become you know, a lot of the news, and then from February onwards, it really kind of took off. Well, in Nepal, we started seeing cases right around February. First case was seen around January, but then we had a hold off. And then suddenly in March, we saw our second case. And at which point Nepal government went into immediate lockdown. So between the first case and the second case, there was a close to two and a half month gap. But then the government thought, well, the second case is an alarm bell. So they immediately went into lockdown mode, which was started in March 24th. But before they did that on March 23rd, as you can see in the slide, and the government asked uh, the Family Welfare Division, which handles all the immunization programs in Nepal, to suspend the measles rubella campaign, which was just about to start actually in the process. Uh, that was the beginning of a, let's say a bit, a bit of a downturn. Uh, so for some time from there on, I'll show you the results very soon. I'll show you the graph. The, the start of the pandemic related effect on health service on immunization, as far as immunization was concerned, started around March, end of March. But then as the lockdown went on, and I, I should point out that the lockdown went on for four months, and it was very hard lockdown uh, for four months, but then right now we're still under lockdown, but not to the level that we were faced for between March, April, May, and June. Uh, so right now we have some restrictions, but not nothing compared to then. So as we went on, as, as this slide shows you, even with the lockdown, the work government was working on different things. For example, on April 13th, they, did a, they had this interim COVID-19 guidelines released for, for different services. And in, on April 17th, something interesting happened. Ministry of Health and Population did a press briefing to, to ask the different sectors, the different divisions to continue essential health services, including immunization. And in April 19th, which is just less than three weeks after the lockdown was started in Nepal, the letter from Department of Health Services, which is under the Ministry of Health and Population, it requested its uh, different divisions, uh, subdivisions to continue routine immunization in Nepal, which was sent to Family Welfare Division. And it also coordinated with different other line ministries. Uh, the, the Ministry of Health and Population coordinated with other line ministries to start essential services in April 22nd. And I'm mean, going along, I, mean, I don't want to talk about everything because this is going to take a long time, but basically there was guidelines on PP, testing, this and that. And may I have the next slide, please? So as we moved on, uh, yes. So the interesting thing happened on May 14th, there was a letter from Minister of Pop Health and Population to Department of Health Services to continue the MR SIA. So the miserable uh, Lubella, uh, immunization campaign was asked to be continued by Ministry of Health and Population and the Supreme Court on May 11th, or around the same time, uh, issued or orders for Ministry of Health and Population to reinstate Mrs. Rubella campaign. So Supreme Court asked the government to initiate and the government said, okay, fine, let's initiate the Mrs. Rubella campaign. So basically, as we moved along, so uh, it, it, unfortunately in this side, it's from right to left. So not to confuse you, the other side was left to right, this is right to left. So basically, Mises Rubella's campaign was started from as early as first week of May, and it continued on, and then it did not stop. And not only did, did it not stop, it also uh, went on to, um, as you can see in July 2nd, Nepal government actually introduced rotavirus vaccine in Nepal uh, from the National Immunization Program. It just started as a very low-key affair, but 
even during the lockdown, during the pandemic, Nepal government's immunization program started rotavirus for the first time in Nepal. And then on July 21st, uh, lockdown was relaxed with few um, uh, you know, changes. I mean, as I said, even today, we are still under a bit of a lockdown, but then from after July, uh, apart from three weeks later on in August of, of a mild lockdown, it has kind of continued. But the most important things are between March, let's say 23rd and July 21st, which is four months, there's a lockdown with restrictions on travel, restrictions on different services, health services, but the immunization was continued as with active involvement with the Nepal government, the Supreme Court, and the regional and provincial governments. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is uh, one of the three or four, four slides of results I'll uh, show, and this will be my major presentation. Now, Nepal has 11 antigens it uses in its uh, uh, routine immunization. And if you look at, th these are the, the ones that are listed here, uh, the ones. And Nepal goes by different years. As you can see, there's a 2074, 75 actually means 2018 in the English calendar. So we're actually uh, quite a few years ahead of uh, everyone else in, in our calendar. But <laughs> we do go with the English calendar also. So if you look at this uh, in this graph, the blue, the blue graph is what you should be focusing on, which is the 2020. That includes the, uh, uh, the first few months of the lockdown. Well, it basically includes almost half the English year of uh, 2020 up until maybe part, uh, roughly around June, July. Uh, so, and then anything before that is the year years preceding it. And if you look at all the vaccination coverage for the right routine immunization, you can see in, from the graph it, for almost every uh, vaccine or the immunization program, the coverage, right, the, the coverage has been close to the preceding two years for 2020. So, so despite the lockdown, despite COVID, despite the pandemic, Nepal government has maintained its uh, uh, immunization coverage at a very steady rate for the past three years. You can see there's been a slight decrease in some of the vaccines, but, but that was to be expected. But again, as I said earlier, the massive effect, the massive impact that we all anticipated for a developing country did not happen for Nepal. And you can see why, based on the previous slide I just showed you. There's a lot of um, a political commitment and um, different stakeholders, including WHO, Nepal World Health Organization, Nepal's um, immunization uh, program, supported Nepal government. So in all in all, that kind of led to this um, uh, outcome. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? Now, if you look at the number of immunization sessions, um, so the number of sessions conducted on an average per year, you know, they go on average is around 16,000 um, per month and um, it can reach up and down, but then usually 16,000 per month. And if you look at the three years, so if, if you look at the different colors, I'm sorry for the most important color is the most lightest one. There's a dip here in uh, where it says March, April, 2020 in the orange box. This light blue colored um, uh, the, the graph is the one for this year for 2020 um, up until uh, July 2020. You can see as soon as the lockdown started around March, the year as you can see March April, it had a big dip. It went from you know a uh, number of sessions conducted from let's say 16,000 down to around 8,000, almost half. But then from April May it picked up as due to the, result, the directive from the Ministry of Health Population. And also the Council of Ministers also had a big role in it. They asked the, the, the immunization program to continue. As soon as this was done, you can see the blue line come right back up into the levels that actually exceeded what we expected from uh, 2018. From, so this actually we had a better um, con the sessions conduction uh, for 2020 as compared to even 2018. So there's a lot of effort put in as far as the number of immunization sessions were continued. So there's been three years, we're comparing three years. So the blue, the light blue is 2020, uh, the red color line is um, 2018, and the orange color line is 2019. So basically these are the main uh, lines you need to focus on. And also this graph is consistent with the next one, which I'm gonna show you. Uh, can I please have the next line? The next, uh, next um, graph. 
number of children vaccinated with the BCG vaccine. This is a very important vaccine, and uh, as you can imagine, so number of sessions conducted, it can, this goes up and down. And usually during September, October, when, is a, when a, we have our festival, and there's a big festival in Nepal during September, October. At that time, there is always a dip, but then it usually catches on. But once again, if you look at the light blue line, uh, that kind of dips down way below uh, 20,000. I'm sorry, it kind of blocked here, but right around 15,000 is where it went from, you know, around almost 60,000 to right around 15,000 at the start of the lockdown in March. But then it kind of climbed back up again and to the level seen in 2019 and above what was seen in 2018. So basically, even during this lockdown, as you can see in the box, the number of children vaccinated with BCG actually increased to a level which was seen, well, not to the same level as the beginning of the year, but then at least um, uh, close to uh, the best case scenario. So basically, what these uh, three slides show um, is that Nepal did its job with vaccination. And the, I, that's, uh, the BCG is just an example. I showed you the other 11 antigens. The outcome has been very uh, similar. And I don't think there is another slide unless there is one more. Uh, can I check this? Yes, I think this is the last. With the Penta 3 vaccine also, same result. You can see that it started off at around 40,000, which would be uh, this, the Sravan Vada, the, the, the months in the, or the bottom, in case you haven't confused, these are our Nepali months. We also have 12 months in a year, obviously different from the English months, but then the equivalent to English uh, months. So the, basically the same, uh, the same numbers as the last three graphs is uh, also applies here. So basically, June, July, 2020 is where I start. Uh, just uh, July, August is the first. Sravan is the first month that is in the graph. Then it kind of goes up. So basically, last year in June, July, where we were, we actually exceeded that number for a number of children uh, vaccinated with Penta 3. So basically, the number of sessions conducted actually shot up even before, even more than same time last year, because we kind of caught up and we whoever was left behind, um, the Nepal government increased the number of sessions so that it catch, it caught up with uh, anyone who had left out uh, in the vaccination. So basically, these are the main examples of how the government, Nepal government immunization program uh, carried on uh, during the, the four months of the lockdown. And I wanted to today kind of focus my talk, my presentation on these charts only to showcase what happened during our lockdowns and overall um, pandemic, um, critical uh, months of the pandemic. Uh, I don't think, I, I think as far as I'm concerned, this it was the last slide. There's a, there's a, there have been a few, I've changed a few things around, but uh, I think as far as I'm concerned, these, this was the last, last slide. And uh, uh, let me just, one sec. Let me, before I uh, pass on to the next, um, uh, the next speakers, uh, this is the same result with the measles rubella on the second uh, vaccination campaign, MR2, we call it. So same kind of results, uh, it dipped and it took off again. So for right now, I think uh, these are the graphs I wanted to show today uh, to all of you. And I just want to add, because I've, I think I've got another three to four minutes to talk. Uh, this work I have shown today, it was provided by Family Welfare Division within uh, Department of Health Services uh, under Minister of Health and Population. This, uh, these slides, these results, uh, some of the background was provided by Dr. Chala Gautam, who's the uh, immunization head and the chief within the uh, Family Welfare Division. And uh, his director is Dr. Tinkeri. I would like to thank them both. And along these lines, you know, I'd like to thank, thank uh, Dr. WHO uh, immunization uh, focal point, uh, Dr. Anin Debos. And hopefully he's also been listening to this. And I'd also like to thank my team. And uh, basically, the, all the stakeholders, ministry, WHO have come together to allow Nepal to move out of the lockdown with good results and also starting and um, continuing the measles rubella campaign, starting the rotavirus, doing some um, emergency vaccination for polio. We have a polio outbreak. They have done all that even during those four critical months. Now, if I had more time, I could go on and on with uh, different information. 
But unfortunately, um, I'd like to stop. Uh, I don't have time, so I'll stop here. But I would be able. I would be happy to share some more information on what happened during those four um, four months of lockdown, uh, and that was carried out by uh, Nepal government. So I'd like to now pass on the mic, so as to say, to my colleagues from uh, Senegal, uh, Musa and Dada. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Samir. Over to Musa and Dauda, and then we will move to questions um, following their presentation. So please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A and in the chat, um, and we will get to them in just a few minutes. So over to the Senegal team. Musa and Dada, you might be on mute. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, I'm talking on my mute. No problem. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, all right. So uh, I was saying that good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, based on wherever you are, and uh, thank you for joining this webinar. So I will be continuing the discussion uh, and uh, uh, on the cases and challenges from uh, the Senegal uh, group. So uh, we will be first uh, discussing the, the background, uh, the methods, the results, and then uh, we'll finalize with the conclusions. And then I'll uh, also let Dauda um, provide some additional comments before uh, heading, giving, it back, giving back the, the panel to, uh, to Sarah. For the background, um, over the past decades, routine immunization of preventable diseases has helped uh, significantly reduce childhood morbidities and mor mortalities throughout through the world. Uh, this is mostly done to routine immunization conducted uh, through the expanded program for immunization or EPI that was established since 1974. However, um, the recent COVID-19 pandemic has substantially disrupted uh, this, uh, this system uh, in most countries. Uh, and uh, in this presentation, we'll be sharing the experience and strategies in, uh, in Senegal to, uh, to, uh, to face this, uh, the challenges responding to the COVID-19 uh, regarding the immunization system. For the methods, we have uh, interviewed key contacts uh, and stakeholders, four of them. Two at the central level, uh, we have discussed with uh, uh, the WHO uh, country specialists, uh, the, the uh, one with the Ministry of Health, but also working um, at uh, the district level, so it, both central and, uh, and, and, and regional. Um, and then we have also discussed with two nurse practitioners uh, working at the regional and peripheral levels, both. I mean, they work in district hospitals that functions uh, that are in both regional and peripheral level of the healthcare delivery system. Uh, we reviewed, reviewed also guidelines, strategies, and relevant documents to, to, uh, to complement this, uh, uh, this, uh, this work. So we have answered several questions. At the national levels, have specific guidelines been developed? And if so, what are they and have they been implemented? Uh, and uh, yes, the Ministry of Health and Social Actions has sent a circular letter to all regions and health centers to give instructions to relaunch the vaccination and surveillance activities. Um, I believe this was uh, in, in July or August. Uh, a concept note was developed to ensure continuity, continuity in healthcare service deliveries despite the context of the COVID-19. The concept note also included safety measures for healthcare providers and communities. Uh, virtual meetings were held uh, between the central level uh, and also other parts of level of the system uh, to discuss the situations, analyze performance, identify problems, and, and, and develop problem, solve, problem solving plans. Um, overall, I would say that uh, the, there was a great collaboration between the central, the regional, and the peripheral level, uh, and the fluidity of this, uh, this collaboration was key to the success story of, uh, of Senegal. 
to be bonding uh, on this issue. Uh, we'll get back a little bit to, to see uh, what, to what degree the COVID-19 has disrupted the routine immunization program at the national and subnational level. Uh, and this went mostly to March to August. Uh, so all, all the activities of, beside COVID were practically stopped between March and June 30th. Uh, and un availability of human resources was a main issue. Uh, circulation of rumors, decrease in the number of people attending vaccination services. Uh, there was also a steady decrease in the accumulation in the cumulative immunization coverage, uh, roughly 10% uh, decrease between January and May. Um, and cancellation of key activities such as regional supervisions that are that are usually very helpful into maintaining uh, these activities nationwide. Uh, and then uh, the stopping of, uh, of many key innovative projects that were also helpful to the innovation system. Overall, so the, most of the key issues that were identified and that are disrupting the system were staffing issues. Uh, so, so I'm gonna continue with providing some quotes to provide the details and uh, uh, some uh, uh, details of the findings. For example, for the staffing issues, uh, you know, it was said that the staff were very busy with the management of the COVID. The level of attendance in healthcare centers has decreased a lot. Uh, the, the nurses said that the staff did not come every day. Uh, also said that it was very challenging for staff to leave to come to work. They had to use several cars every morning to reach their workplace. And this was very hard during the curfew times uh, as uh, everything had to, everybody had to be, go, be home by eight o'clock. Uh, so there was some kind of time restrictions um, in addition to these transportation issues. Patient attendance uh, was also a key issue. Uh, the patients just simply has deserted the health, the health centers. Uh, one of the, of the course, patients were not coming to the health centers. From May to June, we noticed that moms were no longer coming as usual. Some cases simply refused the vaccination because of the COVID and rumors about the reliability of the vaccine, um, loss of confidence. Uh, another quote, we developed advanced strategies to vaccinate the children at home, but despite this, uh, some cases did not want to be vaccinated. Uh, so, some, some people told us they would come to the health centers themselves, but we did not see them. Um, other challenges. We mentioned earlier about the rumors. Some cases refused the vaccination because of the COVID and rumors about the safety of the vaccine. Stack issues, stack issues also, stacks were stacking was an issue. We, um, some of the course, we made difficulties with monthly delivery of the vaccine. For instance, we stayed almost a month without having the vaccine against yellow fever. Um, funding, um, it was said funding was there, but activities simply could not be carried out. Um, how did the country track these challenges? Through continuous communication between the central, regional, and peripheral level in coordination with international organizations such as WHO and, uh, and UNICEF. Uh, surveillance system. The surveillance system has stalled between uh, March and June, but uh, uh, it has restarted um, with the vaccination coverage information being recorded regularly around uh, July, August. Uh, the Ministry of Health sent a, a circular, circular letter to all regional health, health centers to give instructions for the relaunch of vaccination and surveillance activities. Um, Emeni uh, also uh, was, uh, was uh, in addition to the, to the surveillance system, was also a, a way of, uh, of the, for the country to track these challenges. Uh, what programs, policies, or aspect of the immunization system has helped meet the challenges posed by COVID? Um, good communication strategies between the different levels of the system, repurposing of financial resources toward intervention activities, Guidance and implementation uh, of, uh, for example, the Reaching Every District and Children program 
Um, so new guidance were, 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 were written to reflect the need to catch up with children who missed their vaccination. Uh, and then the WHO recruited consultants uh, to assist region and districts to implement these activities. So some details about uh, the programs and policies and aspect of the immunization system that has helped meet the challenges. Uh, it was uh, coming out of health centers and addressing the rumors. So uh, using community-based um, workers um, and going to the health post and, uh, and the community. Uh, coordination between the central, regional and peripheral system. Um, also using uh, uh, community-based organizations, there's what they're called in, in Wolof, the Bagyanubok, the local language means the aunt of the community. Uh, these aunts of the communities and community activists were used to uh, go into neighborhoods um, and, uh, and, and follow up children and talk to moms and just simply help address rumors and, 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 and bring the patients back to the hospital and help to be a link between, between the communities and the health system. Um, good communication and coordination between the different level of the system. I've uh, mentioned this earlier. Uh, they organize webinars at the national level. Uh, and then uh, they also uh, included um, the regional and, and district and, and peripheral level. Uh, some of the course that were very uh, telling is, uh, you know, when one of the nurses said that uh, uh, the plan uh, to, to restart and, and, and all of this was developed by us. We know what we need and we expect things we need to achieve our goals. The plan is validated at the district level validated also at the regional level and at the national level, but it is really developed at the health center level. So basically it is really a great communication and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and joint effort between the different levels of the system. Looking ahead for both short-term and long-term, how do you think this address, these actions address COVID-19 will affect uh, immunization and the health system as a whole? Um, um, so one of the statements was just to work through it. We will hope that the COVID will end soon and we'll have no more cases. Um, but uh, there was also a suggestion to develop an emergency plan for future epidemics, taking into consideration routine services such as immunization. So the course said that we need to rethink the strategy because we will have other epidemics but how to manage those epidemics in the proper way while running other health programs. Uh, because if we repeat the same things we, we, we have now, we will be overwhelmed. So basically learning from the lessons of the COVID to prepare um, the next uh, upcoming epidemics. So in uh, conclusion, uh, Senegal's routine immunization program was severely affected by the COVID uh, from March to June. However, the country has been able to implement successful strategies to help resume, rebound, and then maintain the routine immunization services while facing the challenges of responding to COVID-19. Thank you all very much. Um, I want to also thank uh, the participants who have responded to our questions, the Ministry of Health, WHO Country Office, uh, the Emory University team, Gates Ventures, uh, the Boost team that has uh, worked with us entirely, um, without being tired, if I, I was going to say, uh, all, throughout all of these days to make this happen. Thank you all. So I'll let uh, Dauda um, add some, uh, some comments to this, uh, and then uh, we'll turn it back to Sarah and uh, the rest of the team. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Musa. And good morning, everyone from Dakar, Senegal. I just want to add some command to what Dr. Saha just said. And the comment will be just to, um, to share some few key, some few, few key factors of success. And, and those success will be related to, the, to what have been done at the strategic levels and what have been done at the operational levels. 
So starting with uh, what have been noticed at the strategic level and could be considered as a key factors of success, we can uh, we can not the implementation, as Dr. Sa said a while ago, the implementation of the reaching every district, which is now reaching every children uh, plans that was very crucial to, to catch up with children who missed their vaccination. Another point was also the development and implementation of five year strategic plan. Uh, which was very useful or helpful to better manage and coordinate the humanization efforts or program at the national level. We have also um, the availability of funds for the implementation of EPI activities at the national or regional level, because actually um, our financial resources are, are very crucial in our context, because as we know, we are in a uh, limited resources country. So this is also uh, considered as a key success in our context. The other point also is providing regular and continuous training on immunization to all health care providers, both at the regional and the district levels. Uh, other key point is also reinforcing capacity, capacities and Recently, also uh, the Ministry of Health will provide logistics support to center uh, that are working on the immunization program, and those support, those those uh, logistics support was uh, like uh, was in terms of uh, providing vehicle, motorcycle, cold chain equipment, and uh, so just to make them. Uh, to, to, to allow them to be more flexible in implementing EPI activities at the, at the regional and district level. There is also another initiative, it is uh, just to organize an award ceremony uh, for the three, let's uh, say, gold standard districts that show the best performance in EPI to encourage the emulation. This is kind of uh, showing the other district uh, the way to, to go. Uh, just, you know, awarding the, 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 the more performing, the, the three more performing district in the country. Uh, the other key, key success also is this, continu this continuous monitoring and evaluation activities. There is also an annual review chaired by the Ministry of Health himself, uh, through which their data presentation discussion at the national level, just to encourage efforts of, of all the EPI stakeholders. Other key point also is uh, the fact of signing periodic bulletin, showing the progress status of all health districts this is also a way to encourage high performance and success in the APA program. And the last point, uh, more related to the strategic level is just to ensuring the vaccine, the vaccine availability. Uh, because with the, with the assessment we did, and we have just uh, shared the finding, there was no, no shortage, vaccine shortage notice. So, which is considered as a key success also. So now coming to the operational level, there is more, uh, is more address in terms of community-based intervention to, to increase vaccination rate efforts. And those efforts involve partnership between community organization, local community and vaccination provider just to implement and coordinate activities uh, such as um, uh, mobile and outreach immunization activities to increase the coverage among specific population, such as persons with limited access to immunization services. So that those people who are very far from the immunization centers. So it 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 uh, it is it consists mostly to 
to go to those communities that are living far from the, the immunization service or centers and provide them with vaccination services. So another key point at the operation level is also um, the fact of contacting those who are lost to follow up by phone using the, the consultation record which is kept by the nurse at the at the this health district level. There are also a communication initiative with uh, communicating and raising awareness, especially through the community radio station. There are also um, that innovation, uh, which consists in, which consists to invite mothers to meeting for the dissemination of vaccination data. This is also an initiative to encourage the, emul the emulation and discuss plan to increase vaccination coverage. Another key point at the operational level is also, uh, which is a classical um, activity, is conducting home visit on weekends and afternoon to reach parents who are not available after work hours. So, uh, because there was a, it was noticed that a parent who was, uh, who was working sometime did not have time uh, to come to the, to the health district, to bring their children for the vaccination. So there was that strategy that consists to go visit those parents during weekends or after work time. Uh, the other key point, is organizing what we call acceleration date. And those acceleration date consist to raise awareness among the local community in collaboration with administrative and territorial authorities like the neighborhood delegates, mayors, and all the, uh, the representative of the community. And the last key point also related to the to the operational level is establishing the delivery point services close to the house of the main community leaders to build or reinforce thirst among the community. Those are some a few key points I just want to add. I just wanted to add to what Dr. Musa had just said. Uh, so now I'm just give the flow to uh, to Sarah and see if that. If, if you have any question about what we have just present, thank you. Great, thank you, Musa and Dada, and, and thank you, Samir and, and Nate as well for those great presentations. Um, we have gotten a few questions in, um, but before moving to our discussion, we would like to hear from attendees. Um, so at the beginning of the presentation, we had asked, um, you know, whether or not routine immunization had been impacted by COVID-19. And I think everyone who responded said that it had. Um, and we want to hear from you. Can you share any examples of how you have responded to COVID-19 to maintain routine immunization services? And in particular, have there been any strategies that have, have been really successful? So if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, you can also feel free to share your experiences in the chat, um, but I think we have time for one or two participants to share their experiences. Um, so again, please raise your hand if you'd like to share um, how you have responded to COVID-19 to maintain routine immunization services. And we'll give folks just a minute to think about their responses. I know we have some, some very active members of this community in our audience today. So please, um, we would love to hear from you and, and hear your thoughts on this. Well, it seems like we have a quieter group this morning and that's okay. Um, so I think we will move on to the Q&A, but again, would encourage you to share your experiences in the chat. Um, so MJ, perhaps we can go to the next slide. 
Um, and if you'd like to share um, your experiences as we move into the discussion, please feel free. So to our panelists, we did receive a few questions from attendees and um, again, would encourage attendees to continue asking those questions. Um, so the first question I think is for Samir. Um, and someone was asking how that, how was the hesitancy of parents due to COVID addressed in Nepal? Um, as within a few months, coverage surpassed the last two years. So can you share more about the specific approaches there? Absolutely. I mean, this is a great question. And so I was uh, talking to the immunization chief um, uh, within the family welfare division uh, who I interviewed uh, as part of this. And uh, this is a question uh, everyone is asking uh, in Nepal also as to how are, the, how are the parents looking into vaccination? Because there's on one side, there's this threat of COVID, you know, and on the other side, people not even being able to come to, you know, centers where immunizations were taking place. Well, from what, from the conversation, from the input from him, from the, what he told me, it was that the guardians uh, have not only been accommodating, but they have been demanding the immunization services across the nation. So we have this um, very active, uh, this, uh, this community uh, female volunteers around Nepal. So these are uh, female community health volunteers. We call them SGHVs. And then there's this mother's groups, uh, mother's group. So between these two, they are very active in the community and they're part of the community themselves. They're always you know, there to help the, the other mothers in the community, inf inform them where the vaccination is taking place, why they should vaccinate. This happens all the time. So even during COVID, the mothers, uh, the, the mothers group, the, the volunteers were active within the community and informing people when the vaccination people, the people vaccinators were coming and if there's any changes in the schedule. So the, basically the, the guardians the, 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 in the community were aware of the changes that are happening at the national level. So they were actually waiting to get the children vaccinated uh, and as soon as the word spread out that you know, the, the vaccinators were coming to the community, there were lines. From what I understood, from what I heard, from what I heard from a few other people, uh, vaccinators I talked to who have been to different parts of Nepal, there used to be lines of people waiting to get their children vaccinated, despite the threat of COVID. So obviously the vaccinators were wearing PPE and all that, and the distancing was maintained as much as possible. But the mothers and the fathers brought their children to the vaccination vaccination point to get their uh, get those uh, vaccinated. So, the question answer to the short answer to your question is, there were people the, the guardians were more very proactive, and their the, the demand side was very high, which the government obviously uh, provided. Great, thank you, Samir. And it looks like um, we have. Uh, just seeing so um, Bernadette shared that she's having some audio issues, but just sharing her experiences that they have been using an appointment system um, to assist with social distancing protocols. So that's one way that they have responded to um, COVID and continuing routine immunization services. Um, it looks like we have a few raised hands. So I'm going to turn over to them um, and then we'll, we'll come back to some of the questions that have been asked already. So um, Jayesh, I will start with you. Um, so please unmute your microphone and you can go ahead and, and speak. Yes, we're, we're having a bit of trouble hearing you. So um, while you figure out your audio, maybe I will go over to Alfred. Um, please unmute your microphone and, and you should be able to speak. It looks like we're having some audio issues this morning, which is totally fine. Um, Jayesh and Alfred, while you sort out your audio, maybe I will turn back over to another question that we received that I think is a really um, important question uh, as we reflect on the past few months 
Um, so Saho asked, um, words like stop and cancel seem to not really reflect what was actually happening. Um, so was the attention to COVID-19, um, did that mean that there was lower priority to other interventions? Or were other interventions like routine immunization formally stopped and canceled? Could you explain more? So I think this is for all of our panelists. Um, so Samir, perhaps do you want to start and then um, Musandada over to you? Uh, I, mean, I didn't understand that question about the stop and cancel. I, I, I'm not sure what that question means. Yeah, Sorry. sure. So I, I think the question is asking whether or not with COVID-19, there was sort of a shift in priorities. So routine immunization became a lower priority or was it that routine immunization services were formally really stopped and canceled over those few months? I mean, in our case, as I showed in, the, in our graph, I mean, uh, we did have a negative impact for the first, uh, uh, let's say a few weeks uh, because there was a dip, but then it really caught on after April. So uh, the priority for immunization was obviously very high uh, because uh, immunization in Nepal is a P1 program, it's a priority one program. So the government intervened, so the central government intervened, so did the Supreme Court. So as a result of that, uh, the, uh, the immunization program, which was impacted negatively for the first few weeks, really rebounded. Uh, as you can see from the graph I showed you, uh, and the government did a good job of reaching the, the population. So yeah, but then yes, other services, apart from immunization, have been impacted in a negative way in Nepal. We have had a maternal mortality increase, uh, mortality at ch childbirth increased. That has actually undermined some of the major advances we did in Nepal for uh, improving maternal and child health. So there was um, some, I mean, not so good news from the, that side of things, but the immunization really took on and took off. Uh, yes, I mean, from, from the Senegal side, I would say that uh, it was not really a specifically a stop and, uh, uh, and cancel. I mean, the, the COVID-19 issue, it was a live issue. I mean, it's, it's an issue that we lived as it, as it happened, basically. Um, you know, so as we mentioned in, uh, in, in some of our findings, at some point, patients were not coming to the hospital. They were not coming for immunization. They were not also coming for anything else. They were simply not coming to the hospitals. Um, the healthcare providers also were overwhelmed. I mean, most of the activities at, at some point were just so focused on COVID. And it, it, it took a little time for people to basically readjust and, 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 and start having these, these, these distancing issues, these, you know, use, using the hand washing and all you know, just kind of setting up the system back to kind of adapt to the system, to, to, uh, to whatever has happened. But yeah, it was not specifically a stop and cancer. It was just a, a major event that happened and, and we kind of uh, lived through it and adjusted and, and then, uh, and then uh, with the immunization system, you know, started to use the existing and new strategies to, to kind of rebound and, and catch up with, 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 uh, with the activities. That's how I would describe it, which would doubt if you have. I just want to add um, that obviously, uh, I think that was, that was, you know, obviously the priority was given to the, uh, to the fight against the COVID-19, because as you know, it was a major issue uh, globally. But, and so most of the efforts was focused on uh, on strategy to control that COVID-19 pandemic. And maybe in terms of cancellation or stop, yeah, naturally there was some activity that was canceled, like with, uh, with barrier or measure that was taken with the COVID-19 strategy. Uh, for example, um, we have one main, activity or strategy that consists to go to school, to visit school and see how we collaborate with the school and with a little bit the immunization service. And the measure with, related to the COVID-19 was that the school was closed. There was a, the, 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 uh, the breakdown. So uh, activities like uh, 
visiting home for the humanization program could not be also uh, conducted so on and so forth. So most, mostly there was uh, outreach activity were a little bit stopped. Uh, and as you, as we have with the, with the finding that Musa presented, we see that at the health center level, there was a major reorganization because there was some problem with the staffing. There was some problem how of how, how to maintain the security just to make sure that uh, the health staff will not be infected with, with the COVID-19, so on and so forth. So that this was just some key question I wanted to add. Great, thank you all. Um, so I think maybe we will try, Jayesh, your hand is still raised. So I will ask you to unmute once more and we'll see if your audio is working this time. So please go ahead and unmute and um, ask your question. Uh, looks like there might. Oh, go ahead, JS. Hello. Hi. Hello. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Please go ahead. All right. Well, while, while we figure that out, and we have two other questions that I think um, are, are really relevant. So the first question, and I think this is for everyone is um, from Adelaide asking, how did you cope with the issue of PPE shortage for healthcare workers? Um, so maybe we'll start with the Senegal team and then over to Samir. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, it's, I mean, at the beginning, literally everything stopped and even the, the, the you know, the, all the activities were focused on 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 uh, on on the COVID nineteen. Uh, staff had issues to even come to the health centers because you know some of the uh, the restrictions in in the circulation. Um, and then we started to 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 you know to identify issues about social distancing and some of the guidance that were this, that were sent by the Ministry of Health addressed safety not only for the the the, the patients but also for the staff. Uh, and based on that, um, the measures were started to be to be to be taken with making sure that there's masks at the at the health centers, not only for the staff, but they will also give masks to the the, 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 the patients who, who come in. Uh, there, you know, gels and all of those things. So I, 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 I'm not I don't believe that at, at the point when uh, it was decided that those were needed. Uh, there was a major shortage uh, for those in Senegal. That, that you could, uh, you know, uh, confirm. But uh, to my knowledge, there was a really a major effort to make sure that, you know, these were available at the, at the health centers. Uh, but some of the issue though was after to a, to a certain level, uh, patients were not coming. There was also an effort to uh, to reach out to them through the communities through. Uh, community health workers, through cu cultural leaders, through uh, political leaders, through different type of system, um, and just even also working not only with the central level but also working with the peripheral level. Uh, you know, the nurses at the health centers they they know the community, then then they know that the patients. Sometimes you know, they sometimes they even have uh, people that you know numbers that they can call and and reach out directly to the patients. Uh, so. Yeah, I think that was Senegal, in Senegal, it was mostly an issue of identifying at the, what is needed uh, to make sure that the, 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 the patients and the staff uh, are safe and then uh, putting, those, putting those in place. Definitely, it took a little time for every, everybody to adjust and, and see what is need to be done and, and, and make sure that uh, there's enough of those. Uh, but once those issues were identified, I believe there was no major issues in making sure that uh, PPE was available. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Musa. I think you covered uh, the main point. And as you mentioned, it was a situation of crisis. So uh, all the effort was just focused on how we're gonna 
develop very quickly strategy to adapt with those that situation that is that was prevailing with the COVID-19 and there was not major shortage, but it just required some readjustment uh, at all levels. So uh, it was just a situation that come like this and establish a general crisis though. So there are some adjustment that needed to be done at the ministry level or the central level, the regional level and the peripheral level. So uh, all the focus was mainly, uh, you know, use on that aspect to see how, for example, we're gonna develop very quickly strategy that could help us to, 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 to adapt to that situation. And as Musa mentioned, the main problem was uh, there was a something like a climate of fear in the health district center. There was also uh, that that fear also was in the communities. So most of the patients did not want to come or frequent the health the health district and and also the the, the health care provider were a little bit afraid about the situation because it was a, a no situation and a crisis. So the more we're advancing, the more we are having some more control and adjustment was being done. And we're still developing strategy to see how we can continue, for example, controlling the COVID-19 while uh, continuing to, to, to roll out the, the other program. Great, thank you both. And Samir, over to you about the PPE question. This is one of those uh, touch and go uh, answers. I mean, we know uh, in the early days of uh, COVID in Nepal, there was a big hue and cry about PPEs. And obviously, you know, it, it does a very uh, confusion the definition of PPE, to be very honest. Like, does it involve the overall gown and everything, or just a mask, you know, and then I, and the goggles, you know? So because at, at one point, everyone was, because we did not know much about the virus, right? So for all healthcare workers, even on the field, for even for GPs, you know, even for basic uh, staff that did not have to work in operating theaters and all that, they all did, everyone thought that they, that were the full overalls, full goggles, full boots and everything, you know? But then as it slowly, people realize that it's not all is compulsory. So that kind of, slowed down the requirement for the absolute full PPE and then the mask and the goggles were uh, uh, agreed to be the uh, PPEs that were required. So uh, from what I understand, I, I did discuss with the team um, and also some of the people who went for vaccination, not everyone got the overalls, they did not. I mean, a lot of people, we have to go in the field and Nepal is full of, I'm talking only about the immunization, okay? I'm not talking about the overall health situation. So when they went to the field, the masks were obviously compulsory, distancing was made compulsory, and in some occasions, the glasses were made com compulsory. But uh, apart from that, uh, the full PPE was not provided to everyone due to the, obviously, uh, limitations. And at one point, even the masks were in very high demand and low supply, but then luckily that was provided and that's how the services were started. So. Yes, with the minimal PP, the government initiated the, the, the re resumption of the, um, the immunization uh, campaign. Some did get uh, the full PP, but not all. Great. Thanks, Samir. Um, so there are a few more comments in the chat. I know we are running out of time, um, so I want to make sure we keep things moving. So perhaps um, before we move to our wrap up, I'm just I would love for all of our panelists, if you could share you know, the, the one sort of main takeaway or lesson learned from your respective countries' experience. You know, I heard a lot from both of the presentations about political will, about communication. Um, so, you know, what would be sort of the one big lesson learned that you would want to share with attendees today? So um, maybe we will start, um, Samir, with you, and then we'll go over to Musa and Dauda. Yeah, so from Nepal experience, it's very clear that the the communication and coordination between different levels of the government is very critical. I mean, the stakeholders are there. I mean, the health workers are there. The guardians and the population is there. And that is something that that whole group has to work together. But then, unless there's a political will, 
whereby the top leadership says, okay, this is important, this needs to get started, and this is to resume. Unless they say that, everything cannot fall into place. So in Nepal, what happened was, that's the one beautiful thing that happened in Nepal, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of the lockdown, is that the top level leadership, the council of ministers wanted to resume health services, especially the P1 program of immunization. And so that, and also the Supreme Court also, uh, you know, requiring that you know, immunization start. So these uh, steps uh, with the political will of the government allowed the, 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 the trickle effect, you know, the, the domino effect. So it reached at the grassroots level whereby the other people, people involved were also able to do their job properly. And I'm, I should point out that I was informed that the WHO regional office uh, for CR, the CRO, the uh, regional office for Southeast Asia, which Nepal is part of, um, uh, in that meeting, the regional director, Dr. Poonam Khetrabal Singh, apparently, or not apparently, uh, uh, is documented, uh, uh, you know, praised Nepal for the exemplary work uh, Nepal did in the immunization uh, coverage uh, for during, even during this time. So that is my very short answer to your question. We could go on and on, but we would have time. Great. Thank you, Samir. Um, Musa Dauda, over to you for sort of the, the main takeaway from your experiences in Senegal. Yeah, I mean, for me, it will be also very close to uh, what, what Samir mentioned earlier, is that collaboration, uh, communication, uh, coordination between all level of, levels of the system, uh, the, the central level, the, the regional level, uh, and the territorial level. I mean, the fluidity of, the, of, of that collaboration was really key in Senegal uh, into addressing the, the, the issue that, uh, that has happened during the COVID-19. Uh, not only uh, with, between the ministry, but also even the WHO, the UNICEF, the health system, I mean, through the nurse practitioner at, uh, at the health post level, everybody was involved. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm seeing also uh, something uh, from, uh, from one of the participants from Cameroon about training. And that's also very important because once those guidelines and the strategies were, 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 were written and, and, and finalized, you know, the training, the dissemination of that information and making sure that everybody is at the same level of those and, and also making sure that uh, uh, the support that is needed uh, is provided to implement those guidelines. Um, I think that I believe those, all of those are, are really key to the success stories that uh, that we have discussed earlier. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Musa. I think you covered it all well. I uh, just want to add maybe two points. The first one is uh, there is this, that thing which is uh, we have, for example, general policies which is provided by the central level. But what is very interesting is when those general policies in Senegal, there are a lot of innovation uh, on how to manage the, the immunization service in country. And those also are, could be uh, factors of, could be, uh, I think that most uh, factors of success will emerge from those innovation. Because one of the, Interesting thing here is there is, you know, but not a lot of, but there are some in-country difference that is very important uh, to address when developing strategies. And those people who are working on the peripheral level understood that, that thing very well. So uh, at any district in Senegal where you go, they will, they understand, they know, they follow the, the general guidance and policies, but beyond those general guidance and policies, they have their own strategies. And those strategies fit very well the context they implement or the day delivering the, the humanization service. The other aspect is the monitoring and evaluation aspect, uh, which is done in a way that the central level keep uh, a close relationship or, or contact with the regional and the peripheral level. And one of the key success or some, something I think that is very relevant and could help to emulate that efforts in the immunization program is the fact of giving that award to the 
three most performing health districts who are working or given successful um, result on the immunization program. So the, those are some key factors that I think that is very, is very, you know, is very good in Senegal. Thank you. Um, great. So MJ, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so thank you for those. I know we went a little bit over time, but um, I would just like to end the discussion there. I think those are some great takeaway points um, for all of those who have stuck with us for this long. Um, and I also really want to thank um, our panelists, as well as our attendees, for their participation and engagement throughout this session. So before we sign off today, we, we'd like to share a few next steps. Um, the first being to learn more about future engagements like this one and continue having these types of conversations with immunization professionals around the world. We invite you to join the BOOST community, which is Sabin's global community of immunization professionals. With this platform, you'll be able to join learning groups and learn about other future events and webinars like this. Um, we also do have a brief survey that we invite you to complete. We are always looking to improve on these events um, and also looking at how um, both BOOST as well as the Exemplars program can really support you in your work. So, um, would, would really appreciate you filling that out. Um, and just as a note, this session has been recorded. We will be sharing out the recording, um, a few notes from the session, and, and any supporting resources in the coming week. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Nate to just cover a few of the exemplars next steps. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. And thank you to all the panelists for their presentation. Uh, I just wanted to note that if you have any questions on uh, the Exemplars program or research more broadly, um, here are a couple links and handles for social media um, where you can follow us and follow up. So our web platform is at uh, exemplars.health and our Twitter and LinkedIn social media accounts are on this page here. Um, so feel free to follow up and thank you again for all your questions and engagement today. Great, thank you, Nate. Um, and, and just echoing that, thank you all for joining today's session um, and have a great day. We'll, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks, everyone.